fans queued up for three days for tickets to see the Bolshoi Ballet when they first came to dance in London in 1956, with the line stretching half a mile round the block from the Royal Opera House. But as newly discovered archive documents reveal, Moscow and London had been negotiating hard since the 1930s to try to get the company to Britain. The Bolshoi Ballet's first trip to London in 1956, which made dancers like Galina Ulanova household names in Britain, is well documented. But little is known about the intrepid dealings behind the scenes years before that. As early as the 1930s, Britain and Russia were drawing up plans to get the Bolshoi to London on a tour that both sides thought would burnish their reputations. Britain saw the visit as a way to show Soviet ballerinas and musicians the Western way of life. For Russia, the Bolshoi was a jewel as important as the space mission that they later developed with deep political as well as cultural resonances. Dr Pauline Fairclough of the University of Bristol has discovered archive documents that tell us for the first time about the lengthy negotiations that went on between the UK and Russia. In 1934, as Stalin launched his great purge, the first attempt to bring the Bolshoi to Britain was made by Daphne Dean of the Australian Embassy in Paris, who knew the Soviet ambassador in London and was well connected with various impresarios. The Soviets approved of the idea, but nothing came of it. Then, in 1941, officials from the British Ministries of Information and Economic Warfare decided they wanted to host the Bolshoi. The Bolshoi Ballet was already known amongst British dance fans. Russia had published books about them, which had been sent to the West, while English ballet fans had visited Russia during the war and reported back. Individual Soviet dancers had also been sent on visits to the UK, organised by British trade unions, artists like Alice Schellest and Konstantin Shatilov. The documents Dr Fairclough found showed that officials had little interest in the artistic aspects of the proposed trip, however. They showed that officials wished the dancers to see what life was like in the UK and lose faith in their communist homeland. A memo from the Foreign Office to the British Council from the time says that the dancers would be brought out of their ring fence to see this country, which would certainly be to the good, provided they were shown the right things in the right way. The Ministries of Information and Economic Warfare approached a minor official in the British Foreign Office who was known to be a well-connected ballet enthusiast in the hope that he could persuade the Bolshoi to visit in the summer of 1942. The Foreign Secretary promised to raise the matter with Stalin personally. But the plan was risky. Hundreds of dancers were to have travelled to the UK from Russia on a supply ship, a dangerous venture during wartime. So the idea was put aside, though a further attempt was made in 1944 when John Maynard Keynes wanted the Bolshoi to embark on a seven-week tour of England's industrial cities like Manchester and Glasgow. A Foreign Office document from the time recommends that Winston Churchill should discuss the matter with Stalin as an excellent way of expressing Anglo-Soviet friendship in the immediate post-war era. Though Dr Fairclough did not find evidence that this happened, it signals that the visit was seen as important. Finally, in 1945, a private impresario in London tried his luck, also to no avail. These attempts did not fail, however, due to a lack of enthusiasm. Dr Pauline Fairclough. Probably by 1945-46 the tour could have gone ahead because there wasn't the same problem of logistics. But another logistical problem arose which is that the original estimate of 100 or 110 personnel to go over was re-estimated by the Bolshoi Ballet themselves at over 250 people. That's not with an orchestra. That's right, <laughs> that's not including the orchestra. But that was to take their own set designers because they said well the Covent Garden stage is totally different from the Bolshoi stage so therefore we'll need to completely redesign set so that was partly why the personal estimates were so high I think. The Soviet government rejected the Bolshoi's proposals as logistically impossible while the British side did not want a private impresario to host the visit. Dr Fairclough says that by the time the 1950s came British civil servants were familiar 
with the Bolshoi question. I think what you do find in the early 50s in the Foreign Office files is when this issue is broached again, you see, you know, a tour to London, you see all the old hands in the Foreign Office who remembered from the first time round saying, oh, well, yes, we've tried to do this and it's not going to happen. But there were completely different people on the Soviet side, not least Khrushchev instead of Stalin, which made a huge difference. Although, of course, we've got no way of knowing whether Stalin would have vetoed the tour. He might not have done. We only know, of course, that Stalin was a dedicated ballet fan with his own private bulletproof box at the Bolshoi Theatre in Moscow. In any case, after Stalin's death in 1953, the thaw began and the Bolshoi could finally prepare for their London premiere. It was an event not to be missed, and Clement Crisp, ballet critic for the Financial Times, who has been writing about the art form for over 50 years, was there. The Opera House was still installed in the centre of Covent Garden Market. The queue started three days beforehand and it wound down Floral Street, across the street, into the market, across the road, and people were queuing. So excited were they, hundreds, thousands. The little leaflet was produced showing what the repertoire was, the names of the artists were given. Everyone was guessing. There was a huge excitement. It was massive excitement. I think it was arguably probably the most excited audience, most stimulated, eager audience that this country had known in the century, in the 20th century. It was very remarkable indeed. Huge queues, huge speculation, huge publicity. Everyone was wildly excited. We knew very little about the casting. There was no indication. Of, everyone assumed, of course, that Madame Moldanova would open the, the opening Roman and Juliet. And indeed, this was so. But even after that, the Bolshoi's first tour nearly didn't happen. Clement Crisp. We all got our tickets, everything settled down. Wonderful, hurrah, boom, boom. And then in September, a group of Soviet athletes were here. And one of them, a discus thrower called Nina Ponomaryeva, went shopping in Oxford Street. And she went to C&A Modes, which had a big shop there. And she was caught shoplifting hats. Silly girl. And the next thing we know, you know, she was going to be put into Bow Street Magistrates Court or something like that, you know, and sort of accused of stealing things and don't go and don't, don't be an to go. But no, it achieved massive hysterical political implications. Bolshoi visit off. So despair, horror, chaos, and everyone very despondent. Then it became apparent that the Russian scenery had arrived and was sitting in huge container ships in London docks. Three days before opening night, a letter came saying that the trip was on and the ballerinas flew to London one day before they were to perform. They didn't disappoint. It was an absolute roaring, raging triumph. We were bowled over, quite simply. We'd never seen dancing like it. We'd never seen such intensity, such dramatic force, such sincerity. We loved every damn bloody thing about it. Clement Crisp. That first Bolshoi tour started a pattern of regular trips to the UK. From 1961, they were brought to the UK by Victor and Lillian Hochhauser, who have managed their visits ever since. Thanks to the Hochhausers, London audiences have become used to being able to see the Bolshoi every two years at Covent Garden. But although it's a little easier to get tickets these days, the Bolshoi's visits are still regarded as special by dance fans. There's always an explosion of excitement surrounding the first outing of a promising young dancer and intense anticipation of what the more established members of the company will have in store.